I want to talk to you about this evening is some of the behavioural strategies that the bees adopt to manage their um, colony. And so to illustrate this, I'm going to talk um, with reference to the colony cycle and how the population fluctuates throughout the year. So this is obviously um, dominated by how the queen's laying rate fluctuates. And so we're going to have a little bit of a look at, at why that fluctuates and some of the fa factors that then affect the size of the population uh, throughout the, the year. <clears throat> and then towards the end, we'll have a bit of a think about nest homeostasis and what impact this has on the colony's ability to, um, to rear its brood. So understanding the population dynamics of the colony is actually um, quite a useful thing to be able to do and really important to be able to understand what our colonies are doing at any particular time of the year and also to help us plan. And it's really important that we never um, just think in isolation with our colonies. Don't always just think about the here and now you need to be thinking about what's happening in the future. And I'll, I'll come on to explain a bit more about what I mean here. <clears throat> so when do we need the most bees in the hive? Um, so we need to be able to time this, um, obviously with a lot of help from the bees. I mean, if you leave the bees to it, they'll pretty much do it on their own. But there may be times when you actually want to target specific crops. And so if you understand how you, you might be able to manipulate that slightly, that can be really useful. And we'll think as well about why the colony size varies throughout the year. And <clears throat> the first thing, you know, to sort of say here, which is, you know, the obvious really, is in the winter, they just don't need so many bees. And so it's really a kind of cost saving mechanism for them to be able to reduce the number of bees that they overwinter. And now, of course, we're reaching that point in the season where things are really beginning to ramp up. And I don't know about you, but I am itching for the season to start now. It's This time of year is always really quite exciting. It's a sense of anticipation um, and sort of having come through uh, what feels, uh, particularly this year, like a very long winter. And honeybees are different um, compared to many other insects in that they do overwinter as a colony. So if you take bumblebees, for example, it's the, the um, queens, the fertile queens that overwinter. And so that's much easier for a bumblebee colony to manage. It doesn't have to worry about having resources to overwinter a full colony. It just overwinters the queen. Whereas honeybees take the strategy of actually storing um, resources to excess, i.e. their honey crop, so that they can overwinter as a full colony, albeit a much reduced colony, but you have all the major elements there, apart from the drones, of course. And so this is quite a different strategy, but obviously very successful and also very helpful to us as beekeepers, because it's this um, the fact that they do um, store to excess to enable them to overwinter, that we can then take advantage of and collect as a honey crop. So this is what I mean about um, being, it being important to, to plan for the future and not just think about the here and now. So for example, if you take um, the spring buildup, this is, this is the point in the season that we're coming up to now. We're somewhere between winter survival, hopefully, and the spring buildup. And this is where the bees are now starting to ramp up the production of the brood to enable them then to have enough bees in the hive when it comes to the point in time where they're producing their honey crop. So really what happens in the autumn in the preceding year is actually essential to what happens now. So how you managed your bees and prepared them for the winter, did you feed them well enough? Um, did they have enough nutrition at that time of year? Um, did they um, have a heavy varroa um, burden or did you manage to control the varroa very successfully? And then that sets them up then for the winter. So 
if you had very low varroa um, burdens and plenty of stores, their winter survival is going to be better. And it's those colonies that will be really ramping up production already, even um, in the relative depths of, of mid-February, there will be um, brood rearing beginning to start. And particularly some of you perhaps further in the south and east, where it's probably been a little bit um, more spring-like of the past couple of days, I'm sure you'll have seen pollen already going into the colonies. So that's why you don't really need to think about when is the start of the beekeeping year. Um, it's always a bit of a debate, when does the beekeeping year actually start? Well, that's irrelevant because it's a continuous cycle and being able to manage that and understand it will really help with your beekeeping. And so what we'll do now is we'll think about some of the strategies that the bees have for managing this cycle as well. So just thinking of this as a, a graph, everyone loves a graph. This is um, the fluctuation in uh, the size of the colony throughout the year. So a graph may look like this, may um, vary slightly depending on where you are in the country. This is probably pretty typical for West Wales, but um, for some of you um, perhaps uh, who get going much earlier in the season, you may find that um, the, uh, the steepness of these lines here may actually shift slightly to the left, but you know that's not important. Um, the, the vague um, sort of shape of the lines will, will be the same wherever you are. And of course, it, within this, I haven't accounted for swarming either, which would obviously cause a, a major a dent in the size of the population. So what we see, um, the red line here being the adult population, is that this time of year, it's still relatively low and then gradually builds up <clears throat> and builds up very rapidly um, through um, April and into May. And then it reaches its peak, hopefully to coincide with when the main foraging time um, and the main nectar crops in your area um, are in flower. Um, so for me in West Wales, that does tend to be um, July time. <clears throat> and then that colony, um, the number of adults within that colony will slowly um, decline as we come through the autumn and then be at its lowest in the winter again. So that's a fairly typical annual cycle. And then the brood cycle is obviously slightly shifted to the left in that at this time of year, we start to see the rise in brood production happening. And then we reach this really interesting time in the beekeeping year where the, the amount of brood in the colony can actually be greater than the number of adults in the colony. And that's purely because the adults that are rearing brood at this time of year are the ones that have overwintered. And so they're actually now starting to die off. They're then, you know, they're running out of steam now. And so what can happen is that you end up with less adults and more brood, which is fine if the season works in your favor and if the weather is nice and there's plenty of nectar coming in, the bees can actually cope with this and they can still keep the, the nest warm enough to maintain that brood, even though it's you know, quite an undertaking until new adults emerge and can contribute to the activity. But of course, if we have a bad season and we have um, a very strong spring buildup and then it's followed by a very cold period, perhaps in late April, early May, that can really affect the colony and they might have to adjust to accommodate that. So just thinking then in terms of the queen's laying rate, this will be affected by the queen's age and to a certain degree, um, her genetics as well, you know, is she very prolific or perhaps not uh, quite so uh, generous with her egg laying. And then there's things that, that the bees can't um, influence as well, um, such as the season. Um, the season will have a huge effect. And if we have a very cold spell, um, particularly in May, we seem to see that more increasingly in recent years, that will knock her laying rate. And you'll see that when you do your inspections that there, the uh, amount of brood seem, or the amount of eggs and very young larvae might be reduced. 
And this is down to the amount of food that's available um, for the bees to forage on, and it's the feed availability that then stimulates the queen to lay. And alongside this is the pheromones then. And it's the pheromones that are produced by the queen. They will stimulate the workers to go out and collect feed to bring back in to feed her, and then that stimulates her to lay. But there's also pheromones produced by the brood as well. So the open brood will produce pheromones, and that again stimulates the workers to go out and collect uh, feed. And, <clears throat> and then that also means that they're bringing plenty of resources back into the colony, and that's a single factor that, that, that stimulates the queen. No single factor that um, that influences how much she lays, it's down to a multitude of factors all happening together. And it's really important then that the bees can react to this. And so the, these are some of the things they do is react to the pheromones. So it's communication happening alongside their behavior, which involves them going out and foraging for more. And then of course, if the season is, um, very fav favourable and the, work, the weather is very favourable and you've got lots of lovely flowers um, out in flower, then of course that will also stimulate the bees as well. And so then they will recruit more bees to go out and collect the forage, which then means plenty of nectar coming into the colony. And so the queen will keep up this, this high laying rate. So the queen is actually capable of laying up to um, 3,000 eggs um, per day, depending on which book you read, um, often quoted to be, be between 2,000 and 3,000 eggs a day. And with each of those eggs weighing 0.13 of a milligram, um, that accounts for um, a thousandth of her, egg, of her body weight. So she can weigh, uh, she can lay up to, up to three times her own body weight every day. So that obviously takes an enormous amount of resource. And the queen relies entirely on the workers to feed her. She doesn't stop and have a quick snack herself, um, helping herself to the honeycombs. She actually relies on the workers to feed her. And because her ovaries are so large and take up so much space in her abdomen, she doesn't have much space for a digestive system. So this food has to be really high quality and really easy to digest. Now, when the bees feed her, they do it through a process called trophallaxis, which basically means food transfer. And the bees will also um, transfer food between themselves. And so worker to worker, worker to queen, and also worker to drone as well. So this um, feeding process is, is really essential, um, not just to maintain um, the nutrition of the queen, but also because it acts as a really important transfer of information. So you may have been lucky enough to see your bees doing this um, on the frames during your inspections. And um, this picture here shows two bees sharing food and you can see one is begging and then one is offering. And you can also see how their antennae are touching. And so while, while they're sharing food like this, their antennae continually touch each other. And the same is true if they're feeding the queen and particularly so when they're feeding the queen, they use their antennae to touch the queen continually. And in doing that, they're picking up information from the queen's pheromones. And this is how the queen's pheromones um, partly get transferred right throughout the colony, is through this trophallaxis. So the, the workers will pick up the pheromones from the queen, and then when they're food sharing with other workers, the, the pheromones get passed around. So it's a really, really important behavioral mechanism that the bees have for transporting information around the colony. And this information can then be used, um, so it'll, it'll inform other workers about the um, rate of incoming resources. Do they need to recruit more workers um, to go out foraging? It will tell the bees whether um, 
whether there's any problems with the queen, maybe um, she's been lost. And if you remove a queen out of a colony, it only takes about 20 minutes before you'll hear a change in the colony's um, uh, behavior. They become very um, much more animated and you'll hear them almost roaring rather than gently buzzing. So that, that just shows how effective this system is because um, it's very quick for them to pick up and detect changes that are happening within the colony. Now, other factors that can influence population size. Um, we've mentioned a bit about the season as well. And obviously on lovely, warm, sunny summer's day um, with good forage availability, the, um, the bees will be much more active. And on those days, they will then, if there's a good nectar flow, um, you've got good um, provision of flowers, um, whatever they might be, the bees will actually recruit more foragers then to go out and gather those um, nectar sources. Whereas if the weather turns cold and windy and, and wet for any prolonged period, then, you know, or even a short period, they obviously have to stop foraging. And if that period becomes prolonged, it can have quite an impact on the population size of the colony. And if it's prolonged enough that it actually stops um, nectar gathering for any length of time, that may then influence the amount of stores within the hive. And so then the bees have to adjust and stop um, brood rearing or reduce the amount of brood rearing so that they don't effectively run out and of stores completely or, or work themselves to exhaustion with no food coming in. So these changeable seasons with this stop start effect can actually be very damaging. And we had um, a really good example here in this area about probably about three, maybe four years ago, where May and early April was really warm and the bees got going you know, fantastically well look like we were online for you know a great season and then in May we had really cold winds which really affected the bees ability to forage they just wouldn't go out in it and I don't blame them and so that it actually lasted for probably two to three weeks and that was enough to completely set back the colonies they pretty much stopped um, the queen pretty much stopped laying and so the bees then um, were obviously not rearing <clears throat> as many bees. And so the whole sort of shift in that colony cycle just became slowed down and, and the graph, you know, would have looked quite different. We also saw last year that we had a very good early season and um, the, the spring um, through sort of March, uh, April, and into May was looking fantastic. But even here in West Wales, we didn't have any rain. And so by the end of May, and um, the nectar had dried up. And then we hit, this was followed by a very poor summer. And when it did start raining, it didn't stop. And so then we found ourselves in a situation where um, colonies, particularly colonies that we'd taken a spring crop off, were actually um, moving into a situation where they risked starvation. So what, how do the bees cope with these different conditions? So when you have lots of nectar available, the bees respond by recruiting more foragers. And this is, you know, a, a really um, quick process. You know, it's pretty instantaneous. You know, they use their communication system of dancing um, and uh, nectar sharing to recruit more foragers to go out and collect and from where these abundant crops are. And then also within the brood nest, they'll be recruiting more receiver bees. So as more um, foragers return and want to be um, offloaded with their nectar harvest, um, the workers within the nest, the, the house bees have to respond and actually offload. So they recruit more into those jobs. So, you know, this is a very fluid situation where recruitment into the jobs takes place. Now, when the opposite is true and we end up with these very changeable seasons where um, brood rearing um, is much reduced for a period of time or, or even stops, the bees have to react again. So they need to keep um, 
they need to preserve their colony essentially and so they need to look at, at, at which factors they can get rid of to to try and preserve the resources that they have and the first to go is drone brood so it's not unusual um, in these periods uh, where they're not able to get out foraging or there's a a complete stop in nectar flow and, and the colony needs to think about, you know, how it's going to control this, they'll actually remove the drone larvae or even the drone, um, the sealed drone pupae as well. So if you see that on your hive entrance um, or on, you know, on the floor of the hive that there are um, drone larvae or drone pupae been, being removed, then that suggests that your colony is under stress and you need to look at, at why that might be. And the other thing they'll do um, if the temperature suddenly becomes a lot colder is they'll cluster, much as they do um, in the winter. And they'll, they'll cluster together to keep the the brood warm and also to keep the queen, um, uh, to, you know, to keep her doing, uh, laying as much as they can. But if they need to contract down more um, to a tighter size than the actual brood nest, it's quite common to get some brood left on the out, uh, outer edges of the brood nest and this may become chilled and die. So again, if you see that happening, um, it's most likely in the spring where we get these um, stop start effects and the, it can go from lovely warm, you know, a March day to snow in April. You know, that's when you'll see the colony having to contract right down and some brood may get just abandoned on the outer edge of the brood nest. Now, it's not a great problem. Um, you don't, um, what you need to be able to do is to be able to recognise it um, as being different from disease. So it's not a disease, it's just where they've contracted down and clustered together to preserve as much as they can. And it characteristically tends to um, just look like um, brood that goes black rather than um, sort of brown, um, the, the characteristic sort of brown gloopy mess that you see with the foul broods. Um, chilled brood is, is just goes black. And so the bees have, have done that by just reacting to the conditions, but by trying to preserve their colony as a whole as best as they can. Now, thinking of other things then that can influence population size, disease is, is obviously one of the, um, the main things. And there's diseases that affect the adults and then diseases that affect the brood. Now, diseases that affect the adults, um, this, for example, might be um, chronic bee paralysis virus. That means that you have less um, numbers of bees who are available for the, the house duties, the nurse bees who are brood raising, or you might have less bees available for foraging. So this is obviously then going to impact on the colony as a whole. It's going to mean there's less food coming in, so you're going to have less stimulus for um, the queen to lay and for brood to be produced. And then if you've got less nurse bees as well, you know, who is going to actually look after any brood that you've got? And so very quickly the, the colony will spiral and, um, and, you know, it'll weaken to a point where it may well die out. And with brood as well, um, if the the brood is not able to develop, even if you've got plenty of adult bees to start with to, to rear that brood, if the brood is diseased, then that effort becomes wasted and they don't um, develop into mature bees. And so then you end up with a situation where adults are not replaced and the numbers of bees in the hive become less, and then you have less house bees and less foragers. And so once again, the colony spirals and eventually may well die out. And so the bees also have some behavioural strategies to be able to cope with this. To a certain extent, some things they can overcome um, just with a little bit of help from the season. So things like European fowl brood um, tend to be a bit of a problem in early spring, perhaps when the colony is a little bit weak. But with enough nutrition coming into the hive, they can often actually almost overcome it themselves. So it doesn't mean that the disease has gone, but the the bees are kind of able to 
to sort of over override it and it it just becomes sort of semi-dormant within the hive and it's only during periods of stress that it then causes a problem. Bees also, as we know, have hygienic behaviour and there's a lot um, talked about this um, in relation to Varroa, of course, and this, you know, is a really useful strategy that they have to be able to cope with disease themselves. So the more hygienic your bees are, the more likely they are to overcome things like um, uh, Varroa mites because they they might remove any pupae that, are, that have varroa mites developing within their cells and so interfere with the varroa's uh, reproduction. So these um, you know, strategies are really, really useful and really important. And there's a lot of emphasis at the moment in selecting for bees with hygienic behavior. And you know, I'm sure we'll hear a, a lot more about this um, in years to come as scientists um, discover more about the mechanisms behind this hygienic behaviour and then um, how we can select for that within our own colonies. Now also within the hive, um, the worker bees um, undertake activities um, based on their, their age to a certain extent. So the workers do pretty much everything within the brood nest um, apart from laying the eggs. And how do they decide who does what is based on their age and then linked to the glandular development. Um, so their, um, the glands that they have within their bodies that enable them to do certain tasks. And, and sometimes there'll also be some physiological changes as well. So these sequence of tasks that they undertake can be relatively fluid um, depending on what the co colony requires. So, for example, if um, you may have a lot of um, nurse bees who are brood rearing and then all of a sudden um, a massive nectar flow comes online, well, you, they may actually recruit more of those nurse bees to come and actually help with the foraging. And then vice versa, you know, if you um, say, for example, you, you split a colony and make up a nuke, well, you're quite likely to upset the balance of um, bees doing each task then within that nuke. And so they have to accommodate that by recruiting bees into the different roles. And you may find that you end up with some really quite old bees actually helping out um, with brood rearing again. So this table here just shows some of the tasks that um, take place within the hive. I've only selected a few tasks. There's obviously a lot, lot more than this. And then um, I just wanted to highlight um, some of those that require um, glandular development to be able to undertake those tasks. And then some of the drivers then that actually um, stimulate the bees to undertake those tasks. So with cell cleaning, this tends to be one of the very first tasks that the bees do on emergence from their cells, and they literally clean up behind them. It's quite a useful uh, kind of instinct to have, really. Um, they'll clean out the cell that they've emerged from and pre prepare it then so that the queen can lay back into that cell um, ready for the next batch of brood. So that, you know, is, is very much... Um, driven by you know what's just happened to them you know they've emerged from their cell and they clean it up um, ready for the next um, bees but then um, we'll move on to tending and nursing the brood and for this um, this relies on the development of their mandibular and hyperpharyngeal glands um, which are within the the head of the bees and these secrete the um, brood food that they then feed to the developing brood so these tasks can only take place at an age when they're old enough to have well-developed mandibular and hyperpharyngeal glands. And these actually develop quite early on in their, um, in their lives. So they're able to tend brood. The nurse bees are quite young bees within the colony. And they'll be stimulated by the brood pheromones then. So the open brood um, where the very young larvae are they're the ones that require feeding this very rich brood food. And they produce their own pheromone, which stimulates the um, nurse bees to come and feed them. 
These young nurse bees will also be the queen attendants as well, and they also um, have the mandibular and hyperpharyngeal um, glands in full operation, but they might be at a slightly different um, stage of their um, development because they need to actually secrete a much richer solution um, of this, uh, or secretion, I should say, of the brood food. And that's um, stimulated then by the queen pheromone. So the presence of having a queen there, and particularly a laying queen, will stimulate these young nurse bees to feed her. The bees that are recruited then into receiving nectar, um, they're very much driven by foragers returning with those lo loads of nectar um, as the honey flows come online. And equally, you'll also get um, receiver bees for water as well. So um, if you have um, a water requirement in the hive, which is, is pretty much continuous throughout the year, they need a surprising amount of water within the brood nest. Um, and so at times, um, particularly of excessive heat, they'll recruit more um, bees to go out and forage for water, um, and which then requires more bees um, to receive it um, when they come back with their loads. And these things, um, these foraging and uh, receiver bees are very much driven by what the conditions are and it's, and and what the bees are collecting. So if you've got more bees collecting water, you'll get more bees receiving it and, and vice versa. Now the comb building tends to be done by slightly older bees. They need to develop their wax glands. And this is driven very much by a need for space. So it's often hard to appreciate that within our the confines of the hives that we provide, but in a, a wild situation when the bees um, perhaps are occupying a cavity in a tree um, or a cave or something, um, the bees will continually um, be building, well not continually, but as they need space to uh, expand their brood nest, they'll be building more comb. Of course, in our situation, we often have provided them with comb, so we might not um, always appreciate how they would um, build more comb it, as they need it. And we see it um, when we collect swarms and swarms are, are really good at building comb. And that's because they're programmed to actually go and set up a new nest site for, for their swarm. And so if you give them an empty brood box with just some foundation or starter strips, they'll very readily build that comb for you. And that's because they, they're, they need that space. They know that they need to build themselves a nest. And so they get on and do it. Now, the guard bees um, tend to um, undertake this task um, much later on. Um, and that's because they need their sting glands to develop. There's a series of um, sting glands and venom glands associated with the stings. And not all worker bees will progress to undertake guard duties. And again, this comes down to a requirement on the part of the colony. So if the colony um, happens to occupy a site that's actually you know, very favorable and they're not in close proximity to other bees and there's no risk from other pests or livestock that might um, cause a problem, then they may not feel that they need to actually guard their colony quite so strongly. If there's an issue with robbing, either from other colonies or perhaps wasps later in the, in the season, um, particularly associated when you have um, a drop in nectar flows and perhaps they then need to really protect their stores much more avidly, then, then this is when you'll get more um, of the bees um, uh, recruited into this job of guarding at the uh, nest entrance. And then of course foraging is, is really the last job on their list. Um, this is the one that they take up um, when they're much older and it's really variable in the numbers that are recruited into this depending on the nectar flow. So you will have some bees that um, have the job of actually going out and scouting and finding um, new forage sites. Um, and then they'll come back and once they found those places, they'll recruit 
uh, lots of bees to come and help gather the nectar. So the numbers of this is very variable. And that's very evident when we actually take time out and watch what our bees are doing on a summer's day. You know, if it's a, a pretty cool day or early in the morning, you'll see the activity is relatively low coming back and forth from the entrance. But as soon as the weather warms up, or, and particularly if there's a nectar flow on, then we'll see much greater numbers coming back and forth from the entrance. And that's because more bees have been recruited to go out and do the job. Now, I also want to talk about nest homeostasis. And the, the definition for this is for homeostasis is the tendency for the internal environment to remain constant despite varying external conditions. And this is really important. And bees are absolutely brilliant at doing this. So what they do is that they want to maintain very stable conditions within the brood nest so that they can rear their brood successfully. And so to do this, they have to actually regulate um, the temperature, um, carbon dioxide levels, and, and um, they do this very effectively. So it can, it helps particularly at this time of year. So I mentioned already that the, the bees are already rearing brood within the colonies now. Um, but, you know, I don't know about um, what it was like with you, but, you know, last week, it, or, you know, we were down to sort of minus 10 sometimes. Well, that's a big ask for our bees to rear um, brood at minus 10, but within the center of, your, of the brood nest, um, they will be maintaining it now when there's brood there at 35 degrees centigrade, which you know is incredible really. And to do that, they need the resources to do it. So that's why they have um, plenty of stores going into the winter to enable them then to maintain the temperature. Now, having that stable temperature within your brood nest also assists with the foraging of the bees because it enables them to warm up before they go out on their flights. They need to warm them, their flight muscles and they can do that very effectively by being in this warm environment within the brood nest. So it has quite a lot of really important roles um, in having um, this stable brood nest. So the temperature um, that they maintain it at, as I mentioned, was 35 um, degrees centigrade. CO2 levels need to be um, below 4%, and the humidity um, tends to be around 35 to 45% um, <clears throat> to uh, be optimum then for brood rearing. You don't want the young larvae to, to dry out if it gets too dry in there. Um, and equally, you don't want um, very high humidity levels, which may favor some diseases. The nest site can influence um, the, uh, the conditions within the, the brood uh, nest. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, are, are there lots of drafts or have you got your bees in a frost pocket? Is there a lack of ventilation? And to a certain extent, the bees will control this, um, well, um, to, by themselves. So, for example, that's why um, on some colonies they might actually propolize the entrance a bit more um, to, uh, you know, regulate the amount of air that can come in and out, particularly if it's in a very drafty area. So, in the winter, um, the temperature in the nest, um, they tend to allow it to go a bit lower, but only when there's no brood. So when they stop brood rearing, and that might only be for a relatively short period of time um, with our bees in, in our climate, um, probably you know, maybe December and January. So they don't need to waste any energy by keeping the brood, the, um, the brood box so warm when there's no brood there. So what they do is they allow the temperature to drop and you have like an inner core that might go as low as about 20, 20 degrees centigrade, but it can go as low as 13 degrees centigrade um, and not be detrimental to the bees. And then you have an outer core of bees on the cluster. Um, and as long as they're above eight degrees centigrade, they can still cling on to that outer core. If it gets any lower than that, then it, um, 
uh, then the bees struggle to hold on. And these temperatures are not what the ambient temperatures are outside, because clearly we're not going to have temperatures of 20 degrees C in midwinter. I barely get those in midsummer here. Um, but these are the temperatures that the bees will maintain within that cluster. So this is what I mean by that. So you have your frames. These are the frames here within the brood box. And then your bees might cluster across these frames um, in a kind of rugby ball shape. And the inner um, cluster tends to be quite loosely packed. And this is where they'll be maintaining the temperature um, anywhere between 13 and 20 degrees centigrade. And it's quite loosely packed so that the bees can move around, they can access the stores, and that's what enables them to keep the temperatures quite warm because it's their activity, um, the activation of their flight muscles. They can actually uncouple their wings but vibrate their flight muscles to generate heat. And then you have the outer cluster, a bit like penguins in the Antarctic, where they all cluster together and the ones on the outside kind of get cold. And so they'll all have a bit of a shuffle round after a while. So the ones on the outside can go into the middle and ones in the middle will come out to the outside. And so it is very dynamic. The, the bees are sort of moving around quite a bit, but they all uh, take their turn in uh, being in the cold spot um, and the warm spots. And then now at this time of year, this um, inner cluster is now much warmer. They're not clustered quite so much now. They can, you know, relax this cluster now on these milder days that what they were having. And that allows them then to go and access the stores within their colony, uh, within their brood nest, or even to actually go out on foraging flights and bring more in. So in the summer, the core temperature for brood rearing is 35 degrees centigrade. And in the summer, they'll st they still need to be quite active in maintaining these temperatures. So again, very rarely do we hit um, ambient temperatures of 35 degrees centigrade, thank goodness. And so the bees will use their flight muscles and vibrations from their fi flight muscles to heat in the brood nest. And also they may well need to cluster even in summer. And in some books, if you read, um, they'll say that the bees will cluster below 18 degrees centigrade, which you know is quite crazy really. I mean, that's a lovely warm summer's day to us. Um, so I imagine that our bees are slightly more adapted to, to withstand slightly lower temperatures and probably don't need to cluster at 18 degrees. But it does require a lot of feed and that's what the bees will be using feed for. Um, not just their brood rearing, but also for maintaining um, temperature within that brood. And we tend to think of bees as being incredibly busy and always on the go, but actually they spend an enormous amount of their time just kind of hanging about in the brood box um, within the brood nest. Um, and they'll be contributing to maintaining heat um, just by their very presence of being there. And then, if it starts to get too warm within the brood nest, they need to think about cooling then, and they do this by fanning. So some, in some cases, some bees will actually just remove themselves from the brood nest and go and hang outside. And you sometimes see some bearding outside the front of the hive in the summer. And they do that just, you know, literally just to remove some of the, the warmth from the hive. They'll fan their wings, and you may well see this at the entrance. Um, to create um, currents. And what we probably see less of this now, because most of us are probably on open mesh floors, which obviously provides quite a, um, a degree of ventilation as well. And then if it does get really um, warm, they'll actually bring water into the brood nest and um, spread it about on the combs and the evaporation of the water will help cool it down. So there's a few different techniques they use there to actually maintain the conditions within the hive. But this is happening all the time. They can't take a rest from this because they don't want to affect the brood rearing. It's absolutely essential for the, for the brood that are developing that this temperature is maintained constant. And so, you know, this is happening all the time, um, which really, you know, just demonstrates how much resource the bees need all the time to be able to maintain this. Uh, it's just a picture here of some 
bees perhaps are, you know, hanging about a bit more outside on a warm, sunny day. So ventilation then, um, this is obviously necessary for the bees um, to be able to regulate um, temperature and CO2 levels within the hive. And also um, when you've got um, major honey gathering going on, they'll um, increase the ventilation by fanning to create currents to help ripen the honey. So you'll particularly hear this um, in the autumn when you're feeding your bees. Um, if you go down to the apiary in the evening after you've fed your bees and just hear the, the hum coming from the hives where they're actually creating these air currents to to uh, ripen the feed that you've given them. I mentioned there's obviously a lot more ventilation kind of being offered now to the bees by the fact that we're using open mesh floors. So um, providing ventilation is not something we really need to do anymore. Um, but certainly a little bit of top ventilation is useful in the summer um, uh, via the little mesh patches in the roofs. And then any drafts will be blocked with propolis. Um, so, you know, if you've got little gaps between your um, brood boxes and supers, you know, they very quickly will gum those up. And also, you know, if you've got um, any holes in your, in any sort of joints in the woodwork, they'll soon block those as well. And we would have seen much more of this, um, you know, with um, bees that are in, um, tree trunks and you know more natural cavities they'll use a lot more propolis to kind of create curtains to help them regulate any drafts and and the such like so just drawing to a conclusion then i think we can pretty much conclude here that bees have a really really complex and multi-layered system of communication um, that then influences the activity that they undertake to enable the colony to perform as a single unit. And it's really important that we think of our colonies as a single unit and not as individual bees. You know, you'll hear the term super organism talked about, and you know that's really true. They, they all work for the good of the colony and not for the good of themselves. There's uh, probably a lot we can learn from that. They, and they're continually reacting to the external environment, which is completely beyond their control. And in doing so, they maintain a colony environment, which is totally under their control. And, you know, that's what's so incredible about them, really, is this ability to maintain a very constant environment within their brood nest, which enables them to rear their brood and then have this population of bees that's um, available to them throughout the year for the tasks that they need to do. So hopefully that um, has provided a bit of an insight into what the bees are doing throughout the year. And um, yeah, happy to take any questions if you've got any. So I'll stop sharing my screen and hopefully we can uh, you can see a bit better then. <laughs> Thanks so much, Linva. Uh, brilliant. Well done. <laughs> I've heard a very similar talk so many times and the, the speakers make it sound so complicated. I think you've done a brilliant job. Well done. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Roger. Um, we've got um, uh, several questions. <coughs> uh, I won't really go through them in, in order. I'll go through. Um, uh, here's one. Uh, do bees store water over winter? No, no. So they don't store water, but they do need water over winter. So if they need um, to actually use some of their stores, they actually need to dilute it. I mean, that's, you know, one of the crazy things with honey is that they, they remove water from it to store so it doesn't go off and doesn't ferment. But when they need to eat it, they actually need to dilute it. And it's surprising how much condensation is actually available within the brood nest around the edge of the brood nest, and they'll utilise that. Um, it's obviously very difficult for them to go on foraging flights for water in the dead of the winter, but on mild days, they may well do. But they, they can actually get enough from the condensation within the hive. Well, this was a fairly early question, and you sort of half answered it 
half answered the question uh, as you went through, but perhaps you could expand a little bit more. Um, the question is, when you say recruited, who recruits? Um, but um, I think the question was asked when you when you were just talking about uh, recruiting foragers and um, and receivers. Um, but would you like to expand a bit more on on the recruitment of um, of beasts of various tasks? Yeah. So the recruitment is essentially um, a worker to worker recruitment. So depending on what task is needed. Um, so, for example, if they need more foragers, then what happens is the dancing bees. Um, so when bees have identified a really good forage source, they come back into the brood nest and they'll actually dance and perform this dance, which then indicates where the resource is and how good it is. Now, if the bees, when they're performing their dance, if they feel that they're not actually being watched well enough, I say watch, this is happening in the dark, but you know, if bees, yeah. if they feel they're not um, being kind of listened to or you know, the vibrations being sensed, you know, if they haven't got enough of an audience, they'll actually go around and they'll shake bees and actually kind of as if they're saying, come on, come and pay attention to what I'm doing. And so then this kind of recruitment takes place. So as bees watch and um, uh, take part in the audiences of these dances, then then they'll go out and gather the, the nectar as well. And so that's how it happens is through this communication system that's worker to worker. Um, is there evidence bees control size of drone production? Sometimes colonies seem to have large numbers. Why? Yeah, I mean, colonies will will definitely control how much drone production is taking place. So at the moment, um, there'll be no drone production taking place. But as we move more into the spring and the colony recognises that there is a need to have drones, then they'll up the number of drones being produced. And that happens by them producing drone, uh, drone size comb um, for the queen to lay in. Now, some colonies might suddenly produce an excess of drones, and that might be down to the queen not being fertilised and actually, um, or running out of uh, viable sperm, and she might actually be laying um, what she thinks um, is worker brood, but actually turns into drones. And so that's, you know, that's a different problem then. That's, you know, kind of more accidental and is down to queen failure. Um, but yeah, the... the the colony will control the amount of drones depending on the time of year. So as we move later into the summer, then drone brew production will wind down again because they don't need them. Yeah, if you don't mind me butting in. Not at all. In a, in a natural nest, drone is usually on the periphery, so the outside or the bottom. And, of course, they're not going to lay into in drone cells until the, the brood nest is big enough to actually um, uh, to cover it. In a... A managed colony, of course, you've got a different situation because people um, or beekeepers move combs around all over the place. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, would you advise a mid-season brood break in the cycle to manage varroa? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And it, it depends on a number of things. There's never a straight answer in beekeeping. So firstly, um, it would depend on your varroa loading. You know, if you've got a high varroa loading, then yes, definitely um, think about how you might control that. But also it depends on when your um, peak nectar flows are for your honey crop, if honey is what you're targeting. So maybe, um, maybe don't use a mid-season brood break for varroa control, maybe go slightly earlier. And um, that can be very effective if you do something like a shook swarm that um, automatically creates a break in brood production. Um, and so that can be a very effective varroa control. And you can do that quite early in the season as part of your comb management. Um, and, you know, that can be incredibly effective for varroa control. So I think the short answer is yes, I would recommend using a brood break, whatever um, type you might use for varroa control, but think about when the most effective time that is to do that based on what your aims are for that colony. Not really connected, but when I started bee beekeeping in the early 1960s, a lot of the older beekeepers um, 
uh, uh, made a brew break by simply taking the queen away. And because they didn't need, Beat Colony didn't need so much food, um, it was done to increase the, uh, the honey production, the honey crop. Mm. So um, it, it, it works in some, uh, in some areas. Um, any thoughts on the effect of homeostasis of open mesh floors and poly hives? Yeah, well, from what I've seen, I'm on open mesh floors. And from what I've seen, the bees cope with that perfectly well. They still, yeah. you know, I still have big colonies um, and relatively productive colonies. Um, so in the summer, they're able to cope with it. Now, I do tend to leave the um, inspection sheets in um, during the winter, particularly when we've got very stormy, windy weather, just so that if, you know, some of my hives are in slightly exposed places, the bees don't constantly have a cold draft up their backsides all the time. So, but, you know, that's quite easy to remove then, um, you know, as the weather becomes milder. So, the bees will actually respond incredibly well to having open mesh floors and they don't seem to, to affect them being able to control the conditions within the nest. And the same with polyhives, um, you know, it just means that if they're much more insulated, they may not need to use quite so much stores maybe in the winter to keep the brood warm. Um, you know, and but they just react to whatever the conditions are that they're given. Hmm. Certainly, with open mesh floors, you don't get the bees clustering all up the front of the hive like you do on um, on solid floors, do you? So mm -hmm. it must have something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, interesting regarding comb building. In your opinion, experience, is it better to use starter strips instead of full frames of foundation? Have seen a couple of posts which say that the bees will draw faster from starter strips. Well, again, it depends on the conditions. So um, both are, work perfectly well. Um, I know a few beekeepers who um, prefer to use starter strips so that they don't have to put someone else's foundation into their hive. They prefer to just have the bees build entirely their own um, combs. And as long as the bees have got the feed resource to do this, they will do it perfectly well. So. Personally, I don't think there's a huge difference between starter strips or foundation, as long as the bees have got the feed resource to be able to draw either. Okay. Can the queen feed herself? I guess that mean uh, fertile queen. Um, well, she relies entirely on the workers to feed her. So um, they'll feed her through this trophallaxis process. Um, you know, she doesn't go and dip into the honeycombs herself. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, she'll rely on the workers to feed her. Roger, you look like you're going to say something different. <laughs> this last summer, I took about half a dozen photographs of queens actually feeding themselves. <laughs> really? Yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, and in fact, I've got, I will soon have a book coming out. Uh, and one of them are, are in there. It, it, it's amazing. Also drones too, but it, it's your talk, not mine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that's interesting to hear. Um, how do the bees in a cluster move around if the frames are in the way? Penguins don't have frames to bother away. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's a really good point. Um, but um, obviously the, the comb is also essential um, in that clustering process. So don't forget about the thermal properties of the, of the honey comb, the wax comb, and how it can actually help the bees. You know, it, the comb needs to be able to transfer warmth through it, otherwise it would just act as a barrier. Um, but yeah, they obviously have to kind of skirt around the edges um, with their clustering, um, and it's not, they can't, certainly can't walk straight through it. Well, of course, in a natural nest, you, you get lots of holes in combs and the bees can move, mm. move through. And um, beekeepers, very much if they see holes in, they, they just chuck the combs out, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a good one for you. I heard on a webinar that drones can be recruited into ventilation duties. Is this true? If so, what else might they do? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't seen anything regarding ventilation, but um, there is definitely some um, speculation about 
um, the drones being involved in heating um, within the brood nest and that they actually have a role to play in, in providing some of the warmth uh, within the brood nest. And that makes sense, really, because, you know, they're chunky little things with big flight muscles. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that they have a role to play there. Um, can older foraging bees return to producing raw jelly and bee food if the need arises? Yes, they can, but it tends not to be quite as effective as the young nurse bees because of the, the state of their glands. So once they move from um, producing brood food, uh, the glands actually regress as they become older <coughs> and then switch to pro producing the enzymes that are used in uh, processing the nectar. Um, but they can actually, if they need to, um, re uh, sort of activate these glands for brood producing and of course that happens when we make nukes you know because we completely mess up the um the structure of the colony yeah. and the distribution of different workers doing different tasks and so they will have to recruit perhaps workers back to being nurse bees or or speed up nurse bees to become uh, foragers uh, to, to compensate. So yes, they can, but it's just not as effective because of the physiological changes that have happened within their bodies. Uh, you've done a good job of firing somebody up here. And uh, actually, it, uh, I was always concerned about this as well. So I'll, I'll read it. It's not really a question, but it might be something you want to comment on more. Glad you queried the validity of the cluster in the 18C. I'd always thought this seemed too warm a temperature um, to trigger this behaviour. Mm, yeah, I totally agree. It seems agree. very high, doesn't it? It's, it's very high. And, you know, there were days last July when I was inspecting my bees and they and it was only 12 degrees centigrade, you know, <laughs> such as the summer in West Wales, yeah. you know, and they weren't in a tight cluster. I mean, they clearly weren't flying very much, but they weren't in a tight cluster. So, you know, I think our native bees are able to withstand much lower temperatures. Yeah. I, was, I was just going to suggest that because um, you certainly haven't got any Italians or anything out there, have you? Um. I had the super underneath the brood box over winter. When is the best time to move the super on top of brood box with a clean queen excluded in between? Well, I suppose it would depend on the um, on the uh, 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 on the area, wouldn't it? The locality. Yeah. So you know, once the weather warms up and and you and it's warm enough to be able to do your first inspection. Um, that's the sort of time you can start thinking about switching that brood box back onto the top. Um, I, I also overwinter with brood boxes, uh, with supers below the brood box. So yeah, I'll wait until I've done my first inspection and then and then put it back up on top. Uh, with the difference in brood or cluster temperatures versus the ambient temperature needing heating most of the year, and use of honey, would better insulated hives require less warmth generation? Yeah, that's quite possible. What's important, though, is that you still maintain um, ventilation, so the bees are still able to ventilate themselves, so, because that helps them with regulating these temperatures. But um, certainly, um, you know, the, there is quite a bit of work going on regarding insulation of hives. And, I remember a few years ago, we'd had a really horrible winter and um, there were quite heavy winter losses. And talking to my local bee inspector, um, she actually reported that the colonies that she was seeing being the strongest in that spring were the ones in poly hives. And so, you know, that kind of suggests um, that the poly hives are quite effective in helping the bees, you know, regulate their temperature and perhaps reduce the, the amount of stores that they then need to use. Having said that, I haven't quite uh, made the change to poly myself. <laughs> uh, do all subspecies of queens go uh, off lay when there is a changeable weather uh, or is that only true of native ones? Now, that's a good question. And I think the... Um, the kind of indications there would be that our native bees are much more reactive to the 
um, to what's happening with the weather and they will take a little break much more readily than perhaps um, Italian queens or queens that are not adapted to this environment and they just tend to keep laying regardless which can then you know be very difficult for that colony to manage if they've still got a queen at full lay and there's very little nectar resource coming in so you know that's another reason really why our native bees are so much more um, well adapted to our local conditions. Uh, does communication tend to happen in a specific area of the hive? Well, communication is happening everywhere all the time. Um, if you mean dancing, then that tends to happen um, just inside the entrance to the brood nest um, on the combs just inside the entrance. But equally, you may well, during your inspections, also see them dancing further into the brood nest. So communication, depending on what type you're referring to, really happens everywhere. This is an interesting one. How do the bees reallocate the workers in age and tasks when dividing to swarm? Mm. Mm. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of work been done um, on this sort of thing. And what we tend to forget when we artificially swarm a colony and then we kind of dictate which group of bees goes where, we tend to split those young um, nurse bees from the older foraging bees. But in a natural swarm, when if the bees were just allowed to swarm regardless, they actually take um, a very high proportion of young nurse bees with them as well. So the swarm is actually a very balanced unit in terms of bees at different ages that are then able to undertake the tasks in their new nest site. So a natural swarm is actually much more readily able to sort of get up and running doing all its different tasks than an artificial swarm is. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, Linva. Um, we've uh, we better close now because we've got uh, we got another one on in uh, in less than an hour, and it's one of those rare occasions where we have top of the bill on first and the warm up act, act later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, on behalf of the um, uh, uh, the viewers, uh, thank you very much. It was a splendid talk, and um, uh, uh, we hope that people will enjoy it because it's going to be recorded. So, uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you all for listening. And see some of you again at half past seven. Thank you all very much indeed. You're very welcome. Thanks, Rob.